In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's report today, you know, I think that the operative word, and I hinted at this a little bit in yesterday's Chaplain's report, we're, we're going to continue our discussion on the book of Sam, First Samuel in a little bit, but I think that in the unique place that we are in America right now, we, we need a little Bible that specifically speaks to what we're talking about here, and I'm going to tell you why. Why is there a breakdown in unity? Why is it that human beings right now can't seem to get along or agree with one another? Why is there a breakdown in American unity specifically? Well, I think that one of the best places we could go right now is the Gospel of John and read a prayer that Jesus issues on the behalf of his followers. So this comes from John 17, verses 20 through 23. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me, though their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may be believe that you sent me. The glory of which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them, even as I, even as you have loved me. I want you to think about this. In that prayer, Jesus attributes his ability to love and his ability to have unity with his disciples to God. I want you to think about what that implies. Here is Jesus, a perfect, omnipotent being, saying that the only reason that he is able, despite the fact that he's all-powerful, to love and have unity with his followers is because he learned it from his father is because his father imparts upon him the ability to do so. What does that tell you? That even a literal God like Jesus Christ, his ability to love and have unity comes from the father. I mean, that's mind-blowing. What that means is, if even Jesus Christ can't get there without the father, what chance do we have? Do you really think if even he can't attain unity with his followers and even he can't love the way that he should in the absence of God the Father's existence, do you really think that we have a chance at that? The answer is obviously no. And that goes back to the core of all this. There is no such thing as unity outside of God. It doesn't exist. Can not be done. Now, there are definitely people that can be united in a sense. I mean, look, for example, the Tower of Babel. One of the things that is expressed there in the book of Genesis is that when they all gathered together, there was nothing that they set their mind to that they could not accomplish. That's a paraphrase. I think I'm using the ESV version of that. But anyway, so it is certainly true that in a limited sense, there can be some sense of unity. But remember also that in that same story, in Babel, that it talks about mortar being what held the tower together. And it's interesting because the Hebrew word for mortar is also the Hebrew word for materialism. So in other words, what bound those people together was materialism, stuff, the world. Greed, avarice, whatever you want to call it, that is what allowed them to stay together. They were able to work together for a common cause, but they weren't able to keep it together and they weren't working towards any place where they could have stayed together. Even if God hadn't confused their language, even if that had not happened, 
Do you really believe that a people that were all that greedy and in it for themselves and wanted stuff would have been able to stick together for very long anyway? By the way, that happens and plays out in the Scripture over and over and over again. We see time after time, whether it's a king of Israel or another group of people, that when it's a whole bunch of villains getting together, they are so self-interested, they are so interested in what happens to them and getting what they want, that eventually they wind up betraying their allies. They can only stick together for a certain amount of time. That's not true unity. If we as a country want to get back to a place of unity, there is only one path, and that is God. You know, people that are maybe libertarian-minded atheists or whatever that may be listening to the show, and I'm glad you're here. I appreciate having the conversation with you. But I'm telling you right now, you can't get to a place of true liberty. You can't get to a place of true unity with one another where we are united as a people unless God is at the center of it. Can't be done. It's been true since the revolution, and it's true right now. You cannot have unity without God being at the center of everything. Because if even Jesus can't get there without the Father, what chance do we have? Furthermore, remember that, yes, unity does only come from the Father, but that's in part because unity must be based in truth or else it winds up falling to pieces. One big problem that we're having going on, and I just gave you a perfect example of it in the Breaking the Internet segment where we were talking about the contrast between the Boston Tea Party and the riots that have been happening in the past few days. What was the difference? Why were the patriots in the Boston Tea Party united while the others weren't? Well, first of all, they had God at the center of their belief system. So that was a big contributing factor. Remember that the leader of the the Sons of the or, well, Sons of Liberty, I don't know why I blanked on that for a second there, uh, with Samuel Adams, who was a pulpit minister. But that's not the only thing. Remember that unity must be based in truth. They had studied. They had done their own homework. They understood how men were free and how men were oppressed all throughout history, and they knew which one they wanted to work towards. There's an awful lot of ignorance going on with the riots. There's an awful lot of people that think that police officers, for example, shooting random black people is just a common occurrence. It happens practically every day, and they almost always get away with it. I mean, there are all kinds of lies floating around out there, and the movement is not based in truth. We have to be based in truth in order to find unity. If it's not based in truth, it's going to fall apart. In the same way, what we were talking about a second ago with Babel, materialism only takes you so far. Greed can only motivate you so much. Eventually, you need truth. You need something real and objective and good at the center of all that in order to move forward. Another thing that is also true is that unity requires a common goal, like serving God, like serving the Father, like as a general rule, just being a free society. We need something that we're all working towards. Right now, we don't have that common goal. Right now, we have at minimum two, I would say there are actually more forces at work here, but at minimum two parties that could not be more fundamentally different, and they want the country to look two completely different ways. One wants a full-on socialist state where the government basically takes care of its citizens and everything is run by the government. The other side wants one virtually, and I'm not talking about the parties here, I'm talking about the people in general. Uh, there's another group of people that want the government to just leave them alone. And let's take care of ourselves and keep the government off of my back. Those are two completely different incompatible, uh, incompatible worldviews that cannot possibly coexist. And that's why people cannot come together if their worldview and what they think the country ought to look like is that radically different. And also, and this is the really sad part, unity also takes work. It takes a willingness to commit yourself to unity and to make certain personal sacrifices in order to do so. You remember what we were talking about a second ago, that when you get a group of villains together, they're all so self-interested that eventually their, their unity breaks down because of something that they want contradicts what somebody else wants? See, when you attain perfect unity, the kind of unity that Jesus is calling for in this prayer, the unity of the church, when that happens... That only happens because there are people there willing to make personal sacrifices in the name of unity. 
When it comes to, for example, what Paul tells us in his epistles, he says that we are to esteem each other better than ourselves. Well, that means we have to take what we want and what we think is right sometimes. And I'm not saying objectively right. I'm talking about, you know, some, something that's a matter of opinion. We sometimes have to put that off to the side and do the right thing and, and do what it's going to take to reconcile ourselves with our brother, to put our pride and our arrogance and our desire to always be right aside in order to take a step back. That's what that's going to take. There's very, very few people that are willing to do that in the society that we have now, sadly. wish that weren't the case, but it just is. And so that lack of willingness is also another factor that is contributing to our lack of unity. But the thing that is so important to remember in all this, and this is what I'll leave you with this week, unity is so much more than just being together. Lots of people are together that aren't unified. I mean, you can see, for example, this happens sadly all the time with marriages, with having the high divorce rate that we do now. There are people that are there living in the same house, oftentimes having the same kids, but they aren't unified. And I'm not going to get off into the weeds or, or say exactly how that happens or why it happens. That's a story for another day. But suffice it to say, that is an example of how people can be together, but not unified. We're all sharing this great big country. We're all sharing the land. We're all sharing the space. We're all here. That alone is not going to get us there. And sadly, most of the things that we're doing now are driving us further apart. Vengeance is never going to bring unity. Can't be done. Has never happened in the history of mankind. Where vengeance brought people together. You cannot act as an avenger to somebody and then be in unity with them reconciliation is what we should be working toward. That's what Dr. Martin Luther King wanted. That's the thing that was in the pledge that he made every single one of the people that marched with him sign. And he said, if that's not your goal, we don't want you. If that's not your goal, you need to go somewhere else. We need to say that in the church as well. If your ultimate goal is vengeance and not reconciliation, this is not the place for you. I'm sorry, you'll have to find somewhere else. So let us make reconciliation our ultimate goal. Because that's the only way we're going to find unity. Yes, there are hurt feelings. Yes, there are, there are genuine grievances out there that are real. Some, I think, are manufactured, but there are some that are real. And so because of that, what we need to do is make sure that we commit ourselves to reconciliation. Because sadly, the world has enough vengeance already. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.